right, good morning everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Really excited to talk about interpretable solutions and how we can build Bayesian computational models to solve your most challenging data science problems. Before we get started, I'd like to get a show of hands. Who here considers themselves to be a, a modeler in a Bayesian context or other one? Okay, very few of you. So I'm here to tell you that anyone who didn't raise their hand is actually a modeler of sorts already, you just didn't know it yet. So what do I mean by that? I define modeling basically as building conceptual models and then using that to interpret data. And if you already have done data analysis, right, then you have built essentially a model. So what do we mean with data analysis? I mean, everyone will know, but you have data, you apply some transformations, combining columns, plotting things, and then we get outputs. And then we interpret those outputs, we maybe communicate that to stakeholders, and then we're on our way. You can do that in Jupyter Notebook, which is probably most of you, but even if it's just Excel, that I would still totally consider to be within that framework. And usually there, we're looking for simple relationships between our data variables and things like correlations, but again, just pairwise plots or anything where you bring things together in your data to get inside. And really what you're doing there is you define a model, right? It's just implicit in how you combine these things together rather than being explicit. And well, why are we doing that? has definitely certain benefits. And well, the main one is probably to generate insight, right? We want to learn something from our data and then communicate that to other people with things that we learn. So inherently this approach is interpretable and transparent, right? So the things that we're getting are just pretty, oftentimes pretty easy to communicate and to explain to the other people, like, well, these are the things we've done, this is how I understand my data, and these are the insights that I got. Also, it's custom. So not every data set you will analyze the same way, right? You're using your domain knowledge, basically, that you already know how these things work together to then combine things. And I illustrated this on the side, other side here. So let's say our goal is to build a rocket, right? So these are basically the, the simple wooden blocks that you just stack on top of each other. It's a little bit disjointed, right? Uh, the, each piece doesn't necessarily integrate well with the other parts of analysis, and that makes it a little bit brittle, right? It's all just these different cells that somehow interact with each other, and there's many custom steps involved. Also, the type of analysis that we can do is very simplistic, so there isn't a whole lot really simple data analysis going into this. And, well, one technical limitation is I guess we can really use the implicit model we have to then really make predictions, right? For that, we need something more formal. And that's what brings us to stage two of this, uh, which I like to also call the, the Lego stage, because now we have a more formal model, a statistical formal model. So here we have these building blocks, which are going to be called the distributions that we stack together to build more complex things like a rocket ship. And then, of course, that has many benefits. So this now formalizes the relationship we have from our first stage model. So all we're doing really is saying, well, you already have knowledge about your data, you already have insight into your data. Let's now just bring this together and like write it down properly into a statistical model. And doing that, again, has many benefits. For example, we now are explicit about our assumptions. So someone else who will look at this, they won't have to read like all through uh, the spaghetti code to really see what's going on and what assumptions are in there. They can just look at the model definition and so we'll see later that will be Python code so you can just read that block of code and know everything that you have encoded about knowledge of your data set and how these different variables are gonna come together. So the whole thing is compact, and once we have it in that framework, right, we can just much easier test it and compare it and improve it. So we can say, well, we have this model, 
that has some assumptions. There's other module that has some assumptions, and we're like we're gonna run both of them. Which of those produces better predictions? And well, that brings us to the next benefit, which is now that we have this, well, we can just generate predictions out of the box. Another thing, which is a bit more technical, but I'll be talking more about this later, is that you get uncertainty in the results. Of course, here we still have some limitations at this stage. We mainly that it's still very simplistic, right? So if we're just taking the model before, and that was simplistic, well, if we're just translating it, it's still going to be simplistic. So that then brings us to stage three, when I was building this super fancy rocket. And here we now incorporate more complex structure of our data. So oftentimes, right, there's so much more richness in our data that we oftentimes don't really exploit. And the reason for that, I believe, is that we just don't really have the tools to do so. So that's really what I want to introduce you today to. And some of those structures that we will look at is, for example, hierarchy. So wherever you have multiple groups of data that are somehow related to each other, a hierarchical model and exploiting that hierarchical structure in your data or nested structure will be very powerful. And also, things like time series, which of course are ubiquitous if you are analyzing any types of business data. But there's so much more to this, like spatial data, uh, but that just really scratches the surface. But we want to keep it to uh, a few of those. The benefits now are well, we have increased accuracy and robustness. And if we want to not only gain insight from our data, but we can also make predictions and also make decisions, which we can now directly do. So once we have forecasts, we can not only inform, but also make decisions. The more accurate our model, the more structure we include in our model, the more powerful our, and the better our decisions will be. And that's really the best point. Of course, you don't have to build your own rocket, right? You can just go to a store and build one, and that will be prepackaged. It might be um, yeah, a little bit um, shinier, uh, but the, there are downsides to that. So this is basically the machine learning approach, where you just like the imports I could learn, you import a random forest model, right? And then you just fix your data. You, you fit your data. <laughs> and again, like there are certain class of problems where that's just the right approach. But if you want to <clears> learn about your data and get insight into your data, I would argue that this that the that is a the better approach. So to compare the two, well, really in this case we have a fixed architecture, right? So there's many different types of models, but you can really change them to adapt to your specific data needs. And here we have this idea of the Legos and the composability. Furthermore, if we're talking about transparency, well, these models are inherently black box, right? Oftentimes, they're just like these crazy hyperdimensional things that are being learned, and they don't really tell you anything about how those predictions are generated. We also have to learn everything from the data. So this is something that we will see, that we will be able to inform the model and sort of where we think our solution already lies before we've seen any data. So if you're working with domain experts, this will be a good way. And lastly, the uncertainty. Here we just get one prediction. Here we get whole distribution, but we will see about that also. All right. So that's, I guess, uh, a lot of framework, but now the question, well, what can you really do with it when you get down to it? And that's the bit, the crux of it, uh, like with Legos, right? It's, the, well, what can you do with Legos? <coughs> Pretty much anything here, right? You can build a lot of different things. And so you can go to Infinity and beyond, and maybe now you're also a bit scared, like Woody here, uh, because that sounds like a lot, <laughs> very wide view. So, but don't worry, we're gonna break it down and start with a simple case study. And one of the main things that we at Pines Lab see um, in people using basic modeling for very effectively is for estimating marketing effectiveness. And I mean, in any company that is doing marketing, which is pretty much every company, that will be a, um, a very important problem to solve. 
So let's assume that we have data like this, and we want to know whether this marketing channel that produced that data is profitable or not. Right? So should we advertise on this channel, yes or no? And what we observe is on the input, we observe how much we spent on that channel in terms of marketing over time. That's in blue here. So we have this nice time series. And then what we observe at the output point is how many new users we've gotten from this. So, and as you would hope for, the more we spend, the more new users we get. Otherwise, the whole thing sort of makes no sense. And what we want to estimate is the customer acquisition cost, CAC. And of course, in order to determine whether the channel is profitable or not, what we want to do is we want to see whether the customer acquisition cost is larger, that is smaller than what we earn from a customer, right? So, and we can assume that on average, we earn $630 for every new customer that we're getting. So the channel better be cheaper than that. Otherwise, it would be profitable. So that's going to be the setup. It's quite simplistic in reality. Of course, there are multiple marketing channels and other things. But we're going to start simple and then gradually add in more complexity and solve this problem in, in more increasingly <coughs> complex ways. The simplest way, the stage one way, right, where we just load in our data. And no matter where you do that, can be Excel or whatever, you can just do a linear regression, right? So on the x-axis, we have how much did we spend on this channel and how much, how many new users did we get? And so that's the same data I just showed you. I just ignored the time domain and do this pairwise dot plot. And you can see, okay, well, there is this relationship between them. Um, if I squint my eyes, maybe if it's somewhat linear, even though we will see that that's not really the case. And then what we can do is just fit a linear regression model to this, right? The simplest one there is. And what is nice is basically that the customer acquisition costs falls out of this. And it's the slope, it's one over the slope. Because for one new user, how much do we have to spend? How, how far do we have to go on the x-axis? And we'll, we get a single <coughs> number answer, 648 bucks. And well, if we now get back to our question at hand, that is higher than 630, so it seems that we're actually losing money because the customers who are getting to that are not profitable enough <coughs> to actually make, get us to the green. So, pretty easy solution, right? We just sort of ran this. We go back to our stakeholder and tell them, okay, well, unfortunately, it seems like this channel isn't working, so we better cut it off, right? So, done. Well, maybe, maybe not so fast. So, is there anything missing, you think, from this analysis, if you look at this? Um, like, do you think it was the right decision, or could we have made that decision already? Um, anyone want to think, say, what, what they think is missing? Yeah. But the middle, you can still earn some. Say again? In the middle, we need get less customers, but more profitable. Okay, so here in the middle, yeah. Um, yeah, we will talk about that. Um, any other ideas? It doesn't look very linear. Yeah, it does look very linear indeed. Um, so the model is, is overly simplistic. I, don't know. I think we don't adjust for time. Uh, so it's a very simple linear model which does not adjust for time span. And well, that makes for your correlation. Yeah, that's another great point. So it says we're ignoring time, and probably things are changing all the time, right? So we're just saying, well, yeah, it, on this plot, you already see that we're throwing time away. So, and we will fix that later as well. So there's one thing that I haven't heard, um, and I'll give you a clue, which is that we only get this one solution here, right? But if you look at this, for example, just visually, I mean, it could also be a reasonable explanation of the data, right? But the result that we're getting is completely different, right? In this case, actually, that would be a good channel. Or maybe uh, these other lines, right? They all provide like a somewhat reasonable fit. So why should we ex expect that only this line and this line alone is the only line we'll ever consider as a plausible solution, right? So if any of those other are true or even likely, right, have a certain probability of being correct, then 
then we might want to entertain those. So this is what moves us to stage two, where now just the, this very simplistic regression model we want to formalize and look into uncertainty, uh, which is really what I was alluding to with those individual lines. So how does that work? So here we're going to introduce uh, a bunch of different concepts. And one is what I mentioned in the beginning when I mentioned that we can already constrain the solution space. So before we have even seen any data, right, we can still reason about what we think, how effective these marketing channels are. right? Because we've seen other marketing channels, there are industry standards. Maybe you have an expert who has already worked with this data for a long time, and they will tell you, like, oh, yeah, I, on average, like, this will be the range of parameters where this is happening. And so we can get that information and encode it and get better fits by constraining the model to only consider those things that are really actually within the realm of what we already know is going to happen, right? So for one thing, at the very least, if you don't know anything, you know that it's going to be positive, right? So it can be negative. But of course, there's more. Like for example, uh, in this case, this very last line, the red line, um, this one here, that is very expensive. Already, the the person who like gave you the data tells you like, oh well, no, you don't even need to consider that. Like, no channel is that expensive. Like, that's completely impossible. So, at this stage, where we're defining our domain knowledge, we can already scratch that out. Now. We want to formalize this very simplistic model, and this essentially we do this um, as we do so next. We can either do that like as a statistical formal model, or also in computer code. And here we are encoding the model structure, um, which is basically how we get from our solutions, which are the CACs, the custom acquisition costs, to our data. That's the thing that we observe. So we're mapping into the solvers again. And then we want to evaluate whether the solution we observe, or the solution we want to evaluate, and of course it's not just going to be these three, but like all possible solutions, how plausible that is. And for that, we just see how it good does it explain the data. And then those that do a good job of explaining the data, those we keep around. Right? So before, and this is quite different now, so before we just said, well, just give me the best fitting line, right? That when this nonlinear regression, now we're saying, give me any line that does a reasonably good job of explaining the data. So now we're not just getting a single value like before, now we're getting a whole distribution of values. And those values that are very probable, we'll see more often than those values that are very improbable. So, that already gives me now a sense for like how much uncertainty I have in those estimates. Really. Now, PyMC, which is the library that we're going to use to solve this, allows me to encode this in Python code. And that for me is like a really important superpower, basically, is I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not that great at math. I'm mostly a coder. So here, I now have the ability to just write my model, my statistical model down in computer code, and then hit the inference button. I don't have to do any math, and I just get my uncertainty estimates, and I can just keep improving the model, keep building more structure to that rocket ship, right? Let's go through <coughs> this in more detail, step by step, where now, okay, what are the solution proposals? So we have to define basically what are plausible values of the custom acquisition cost, and we do that through a call so called prior a probability distribution. And well, this is up to you basically. Um, you could just say, well, it just only has to be positive. That's the only thing I want to constrain. Or you could say, well, actually, I know that it's going to be in this range, right? So here I'm choosing a very simple normal distribution that says, okay. The customer acquisition cost will be this range. And by the way, the values here you need to multiply. So this would be $200, this would be $600, and $1,000. So we say $1,000 is going to be very, very unlikely. Next, let's move to how do we define the model. So here, and I'm not going to go into too much detail of the code. 
but just wanted to give you a highlight of what you can do with Pipe C. So this is the modeling language that we're using to build these models. And they allow you to write down here in Python code how you think your different variables interact, right? So this is basically the formalization of what I told you before, where you have like maybe spread out for like, well, uh, the customer acquisition cost is related to my new users in this way. And that's what we just write down. So it has many of the um, estimation algorithms. So here I can just call estimation, the estimation function pn.sample and get my estimates. And there's many different algorithms that do that, and PyMC has many of those. So it's very, it has all the modern ones that we know about this, uh, the not sample and variational inference. <laughs> also, we try to make it as user friendly as possible. It still requires some knowledge basically of the, the domain. And we um, also, Bayesian modeling often has the, uh, people often say that it's slow, and that definitely used to be true. But actually, there has been significant advancement in the last couple of years for this, where now you can really run this on large data, very, very complex models. So at PyMC Labs, where we help other companies uh, implement these models, we build models with hundreds of thousands of parameters and very complex structures, and they fit in uh, a few minutes. So, uh, and this is helped by our backend, where we can compile these models from the Python code that we write. We take that and either to either C or to JAX or to number. If you compile it to JAX, you can run it in the GPU. So there's many different scaling options available to us. Also, I, <coughs> it comes with batteries included, like every good Python package should. We have already a lot of the distributions. We have Gaussian processes and a whole bunch of other like more uh, structured parts that you can just borrow from. And we really try and build a community. So there's discourse, meetups, and a whole bunch of other ways to get involved also as a open source contributor. So I'm not going to go through this, but this is basically the linear regression model, the customer acquisition model that we have. Um, basically, it is a linear regression. So we have an intercept and a slope term. Here's the linear regression term. We have a parameter for the noise. Here we specify the priors. And Here's how we relate that to data again. And then we just call this function and it will estimate everything. So again, not going to go into detail. Um, check it out in your own time, but just to give you a flavor of what that looks like. So now that we have our price, we have our model, how do we interpret the solutions that we get? So I already explained that a little bit. That Again, we're not just getting a single output, we're getting many, many different solutions to this problem according to how plausible that solution is, how well it explains the data. And what is cool is once we have that, we are not forced to just give yes or no answers. Okay? So before it was like, oh, the customer acquisition cost was higher than what I earned from a customer, so it's an unprofitable channel, so we just have to switch it off. Here I can just now say, well, instead, there's a 60, only a 60% probability that this channel is unprofitable. So this is now much more powerful, right? If you go to a stakeholder, you're like, well, um, if, I, if I had to pick, right, probably I would lean to the side that it's not profitable, but really we don't have enough data. With only having observed this for 100 days um, and the margins being so tight, there's not a lot we can say. So, um, yeah, probably just should weight and collect more data. And what is also neat is that this is basically just all these samples, right, uh, which are my plausible solutions to the customer acquisition cost, are just in the NumPy array. And I can just slice that and say, okay, how many of those are above this line of uh, how much I earn from each customer, $630, and how many samples are below that. And that gives me 60%. So all I had to do here was count. So you don't have to, like, if you know about frequent statistics, you don't have to look into t-tests and all of that other thing and, like, tests that other people have made. Now you just <laughs> sort of look at your posterior and you can do your own statistics. Cool. 
So that basically is the simple model. Now let's talk about improving this. So already some of you had suggestions earlier on how we might want to do that. Um, but yeah, so like my friend Greg would say, he's not looking at single answers, but you want to look at all possible answers. So include the um, one thing that we saw, right, is that the linear fit is actually not that great. So there was this pattern that the, the, the data seem to saturate off. And that is something that we do see, just because we spend more on advertising doesn't mean that we get more users up at, up at a certain point. So there are these saturation effects. And well, we can just improve our model now. And this is really the way this works. So you, you would first build this very, very simplistic model. You plot it against you know, the model predictions against your data, and you see, oh, a linear fit really isn't a good solution. Well, maybe I should improve my model now and include this decay, uh, this decay function. And when we do that, well, we see that now the solutions, which are gray here, the model predictions, are much more in line with the actual data. So we have much more improved fit by incorporating more of what we know about the structure of the problem. And although I didn't show it, I hope you believe me that in code, uh, this was really just a three line change. So that's again coming back to this idea of iteratively improving the model with just taking the existing thing and slowly adding new pieces to that product. So that's it basically for the simple concept. Now I want to go into a little bit more advanced ideas and then how we can go from stage two differently, right? So we have our simplistic model that does a pretty decent job, but reality is much more complex. There's many more things that we need to consider. And here we work with HelloFresh, um, which is a food delivery company where they send you um, boxes of, of ingredients and then you cook your own meals with those. And they, of course, are doing um, a ton of marketing, right? So they uh, have hundreds of millions in marketing that they spend every year. So they really want to know how effective that is, right? And, and of course, they're also not just spending on a single channel, but many, many channels. Which channel is best? Where should they spend their marketing? Dollar? How should they parse that out? And in this case, they came to us and already were at stage two. So this is from 2020, where they actually gave a talk at our conference, Pine Zion. Uh, so it's a web series, so check it out if you're interested in this topic, or maybe giving an online talk there. They already gave a talk here about their, um, what is called the media mix model, which is these types of models that I just explained. And this is where we got to know them, basically. And they were like, oh yeah, we have this really cool model, and it does a pretty good job. But they knew that their model was lacking. So it, it did a pretty good job of estimating things, but they, it, it was basically stage two, not stage three. And one of the key problems was that uh, what is commonly known as the co-star problem. So if they were to add a new marketing channel, that would be very noisy, right? The estimates that you get for a new marketing channel are just terrible because you don't have a lot of data, right? You just have it running maybe a few weeks. And as we know, if you don't have a lot of data, we get very uncertain estimates. So at least we know that we don't know, but still we would like to get better inferences. The other problem that we want to talk about is that the model is static. So we're not able to make any, we're not able to estimate any changes in marketing effectiveness. So that's what you said before, where you said, oh yeah, um, we're not taking time into account here at all, right? We're just throwing that out the window. But we know that, for example, during COVID, certainly the effectiveness of our marketing channels was severely impacted. And this is something that we want to maybe include in our model. <laughs> so let's start with the cold start problem. How do we fix that? One idea is, because we're not observing just a single channel, right? We're observing many channels. And usually, well, the, the stage two model assumed that all those channels were completely independent. So you could just 
more or less run separate models for each of those channels, like I showed at the beginning, and you get very similar results. But is that really reasonable assumption? Probably not, right? Like we know that if I have customer acquisition costs on Google of 600, probably on Facebook there will not be a million, right? Or probably not even 800. So there will be a lot of similarities between these different channels. And we can exploit that by incorporating that knowledge that there are similarities into our model. So this is what the data now looks like. Uh, still with the independent thing, and then we want to see what happens if we include the knowledge about the, the, the similarities. So here, every different color is a different marketing channel. So this might be Google, maybe Facebook, this might be TV, radio, podcasts, whatever. And here on the x-axis is what I estimate as my customer acquisition cost to be for each channel. So I just run the model for each of those channels. And then here I have the plausibility. So again, that's the posteriors that are plotting here. So you can see we get pretty narrow distribution. So we are pretty certain in the customer acquisition costs here. And we can now here on the left -hand side, we see the new channel that we just turned on. So we don't have a lot of data for this, which you can also see in the widens, right? So we don't have a lot of data, so we're very uncertain. But also you see that this is fairly far away, right? Like the other channels are all over here, and this one is just ex seems extremely expensive in relation to the others. And if I have a model that doesn't take those similarities into account, well, it will be totally happy to just keep this be over here, right? So this is indeed well, the estimate that we get if we assume that they depend. And the the code start problem in action, we don't have a lot of data, very uncertain, and we're very prone to outliers and extreme estimates. So how do we fix it? How do we include this knowledge about uncertainty? Well, we can just add more structure to our model. We can say, rather than each of these channels being independent, we can say, well, actually, I know that they are related to each other, and I'm going to communicate that to the model and say that there is an overarching distribution that all these channels come from. So I'm going to say the, the mean of these, which are here these dots, come from a new distribution, which I here call the global distribution. So this is basically how do I think all marketing, all my marketing channels perform on average. And as we can see, if we make that assumption that these, and here are the assumptions that the marketing channels all will come from this normal distribution. So the, yeah, um, the custom acquisition costs come from this normal distribution and we're also estimating the, this distribution together with everything else. If we make that assumption, we get a better estimate of this outlier in two ways. One is it gets pulled in. So it doesn't assume that it's X extreme, and that makes sense, right? If I know, if the model now knows that all of them are over here, it will not really assume that this one is as extreme as it is. And also, compared to before, it um, it gives us more certainty. So how does that work, right? It almost seems seems too good to be true. So. Let's compare this with the case from before, right? So here, this was the outlier. This was the pulled-in thing. And, well, I would argue that this is a better, more robust estimate. And the reason for this effect is that if we assume that these custom acquisition costs, as like small dots here, come from this distribution, well, then this point is very, very unlikely to come from this distribution, right? And the model says, okay, well, because it's so unlikely under this distribution, I'm going to move this closer in to be to have higher likelihood under this distribution, so to be closer together with the others. So it shrinks everything towards this distribution. And that is, well, is the solution to that, and oftentimes is a very um, powerful way of getting estimates whenever you have grouped data or nested data. And 
you can also you can use this in many other scenarios. For example, if you have geographical regions or international media mix models, all of those things. Um, but maybe you're not working in marketing. I bet you have hierarchies in your data or all these types of structures, right? Like maybe you have different geographic regions, maybe you have different product categories, right? Like an e-commerce store that is showing two shoes. The new shoe category, high heels, will be able to, will probably be similar in many ways in terms of how it's performing to other women's shoes. Um, and women's shoes eventually is probably also going to be related in some way, right, compared to other types of clothing. So, yeah, if you start to think about, well, yeah, how is my data structured, I think you will probably identify that there are going to be hierarchies in there. And if you exploit them and build a model that actually incorporates them, you can get vastly more accurate answers. So let's take a look at that second problem is that the model is static, so we're not able to adjust to any market changes, right? So we removed the time dimension, and that um, also leads to just poor estimates. So the previous model, as I said, assumes that channel effectiveness does not change over time, but with basic modeling, we have many different ways of incorporating time series and time varying parameters. And one of them is to use what is called a Gaussian process. So what, what does that do? How do we think about that? So again, now we have each, uh, like, let's say, just three different channels and the custom acquisition cost. And before, we ignore time, right? So you can just imagine that across time, we just always have the same value. We just estimated the, the constant value across time. And then, well, those values could be different, but not over time, just per channel. <coughs> now what this allows us to do is to say, let's relax that assumption. Let's allow there to be changes, but not just any changes. They have to be gradual over time, because we're not going to assume that like from one day to the next, there's going to be huge jumps, but slowly things will be drifting over time. So that's what Gaussian processes allow us to do, is incorporate this knowledge that this gradual changes we can incorporate how fast we expect these changes to happen. We can incorporate other things like seasonality or trends in there as well. So it's a very rich class of models that we can use. And this is basically the output of that. So now, for example, this might be during COVID. Um, we see that there's this dip in all these channels. And, and, and now we have a time model estimate. And again, in code, this will not be a dramatic code change you just replace the static parameters with time varying parameters and then you get your estimates that way. However, before, so now we're back to this flat model, right? Where like these things don't really correlate with each other. And well, we can just take that existing idea, this previous idea of the hierarchies, and combine that together with the time series model as well. And when we do that, what we get is essentially a hierarchical time varying process. Again, the same idea, we have these individual channel estimates, and now they change over time, and then we have a global estimate, which is essentially how does all my marketing channels change over time. So there, we would expect things like seasonality or again, COVID, did not just have an effect on one of them, but across all of them. And the model would incorporate that. So, Let's take a step back and just think like, okay, well, this, is, this is pretty insane, right? We have, from just a linear regression, blown things up to have time varying parameters. Um, and it, like for every time point, for every channel, we have a different parameter that follows this crazy structure. And now it's also hierarchical. So there's really a lot going on. And that's sort of the point, right? So with this, tool, we can build these very advanced models that incorporate all that existing structure that's in there already. And with PIMC, you can actually fit those models in reasonable time and, and still get estimates. And of course, the question is, well, why, why would we want to do that? And well, the answer is because we get increased accuracy in our analysis. We get 
bit of forecasts. And this is what I show here. So here we have the mean absolute error. So this is a whole row test. So we fit the model and then we predict it on unseen data. And here we compare several different models with each other. So mean absolute error, so lower is better. We have the linear model from the very beginning. We have uh, a model from Google, the, uh, the, which is like a standard linear mix model. Uber has a model. Uh, Facebook also has a model called Robin, uh, which we also compared. It's, it's not in here though because it can predict on whole lot of data, but um, anyway. And then the model that we developed together with HelloFresh, which beats all of the other ones, right? And because the other ones, like this one, is like the very simplistic one. Uh, that one did not take time into account. Uh, <laughs> this one does take time into account, but it's not hierarchical. So all of these structures, at the end of the day, give me better answers. And that's, that's what really is important, right? If you have that hundreds of millions um, that you're spending, the cost savings are immense. If you have a better marketing budget distribution across your channels, so it really makes sense to try and get the most out of your data. And that's really uh, where the basement approaches are powerful. Um, okay. So, to sum up, I told you about how we can go from this very simplistic approach to stage two, where we formalize things, right? So, <coughs> hopefully, you can appreciate that you can, like, already are doing, we already have a mental model. And then you just formalize that mental model into code. And then once it's in code, from there you can really easily add new things on top and build more complex structures to get improved models and get that stage three uh, super awesome rocket. I showed you how we can incorporate prior knowledge, and that increases the robustness of our estimates. So that was at the very beginning, right, where we had different custom exhibition costs, and some person told us, well, that expensive uh, is, is like no channel is that expensive, and that greatly makes it easier and also reduces outliers, right? If we can already say that this is unreasonable, I will not get estimates that are unreasonable. And with frequent statistics or other models, that's often a big problem that we're getting like outlier estimates. Then we looked at uncertainty quantification. So we have not just a single answer, but we have a whole distribution of answers. And what's the benefit of that? Well, we can answer questions probabilistically. Rather than saying, no, the channel is not profitable, turn it off. We can say, OK, well, we're actually very uncertain whether it is or not. We need to collect more data. If you do need to make a decision, well, at least now you know what the risk of that decision is, right? So being able to give certain estimates and those types of um, yeah, probabilistic answers <coughs> in the policy framework is very powerful. And really, I think for me, the most important thing is that we can build these flexible and complex models. So your data oftentimes has a lot of structure in it, nonlinearities time series, hierarchical things, right? And in order to handle all these intricacies, we need a sophisticated framework. And basic modeling offers you that. So if you want to get more out of your data analysis while it's still being transparent, right, and have models that you can explain to your stakeholders rather than just some deep net, um, even though they're very powerful, you can really explain what they have learned. So that's that's for me, one of the biggest benefits, especially when using it in a business context, right? So our customers at Types Labs, where we help companies build these types of models, oftentimes, like machine learning isn't even an option for them, right? So they just want to know, well, what are my customer acquisition costs, right? Or which, how should I distribute my marketing dollars? Or is there a treatment effect of the new drug that I'm developing or not? Or whatever problem that you work on, right? Where you need to communicate to stakeholders the insights of the model. And of course, uh, I only alluded to this, but 
Time C is one of the tools that allows you to do that easily. There's also others which are great, uh, but that's the one that we have uh, developed. And uh, yeah, we're very excited about it. So if you, uh, oh yeah, one last thing. We have recently um, released a new library called Time C Marketing. And by having now, especially we work on this marketing problem with many clients and doing this over and over, we sort of see the patterns and wanted to just decode our model and just give it to the public. So you can check it out at timesymarketing.io. Again, we try to make it super easy and customizable to your problem. They have these media mix models that I mentioned. They also have customer life and value models. We also want to add phase and AB tests and, and things like that. So uh, yeah, check it out and please contribute back. And yeah, if you want to know more, um, we have a very cool case studies library on pipec.io. It has many different, yeah. Um, there's a section on time series models, a section on hierarchical models, a section on linear models, and, and what have you, survival models, geospatial models, anything you, uh, anything, any pattern that you might have in your data, there will probably be a chapter on this. So I think that's a great starting point for more on that. So with that, uh, thank you so much for your attention. So the way we get to many different regression lines is that we have an algorithm that just tries different ones. Mm -hmm. So we start from the prior and we just uh, propose a couple of ones. For example, we would say, how good does a custom acquisition cost of a million dollars explain this data? Right? Like a line that's here with data that's here. So not at all. So we just pass it. Then the sampler will say, well, what about a line that's a little bit closer, that's a customer's acquisition cost of $600? Oh, that's actually a pretty good fit. So we'll keep that and store it in that collection of plausible answers. And we just keep doing that over and over again. And that is, what is this Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, which is just basically trying all kinds of different solutions. And then it will keep those that are plausible and toss those that are implausible. So it's basically trying a lot of them and just seeing what sticks. Does that help? Well, then I have a follow-up question. Great. Uh, not sure how to formulate it, but uh, does it, well, if you are now using Monte Carlo to generate these lines, and for all practical purposes, there are infinitely many lines it literally becomes a tricky question of how do you apply Monte Carlo to this in a way that will not skew the result. Um, I'm, I'm, did you understand the question? Because um, so while well, you're asking how does it not skew the result, um, I, I, although I'm not sure why would like why there's a concern that it would do that. Well, uh, if you apply Monte Carlo to it, and you have these two parameters for the line, uh, you can uh, use. Uh, uh, well, you can use the bell curve to generate those two parameters, or you can use a uniform distribution to generate those two parameters. And based on how you generate your parameters for the lines you try, you can get a completely two different sets of lines, because ah. there are infinitely many lines. And depending on how you generate the Monte Carlo, you get different results. Oh, yeah. OK, so you're correct that there's different ways of generating the lines. But there's only one way of deciding whether you keep a line or not. So, uh, the, and there, there are like only certain ways allowed of how you generate them. So there's a lot of math behind these types of algorithms. And but it, it doesn't um, if your if your proposals have certain follow certain rules, 
you are guaranteed to always get the same correct results no matter which of those you use. So there's many different markup channel on the cover algorithms. If they all converge to the correct solution, they're all in the same answer. So that that is um, so yeah, you're protected by mathematical proofs basically that that isn't happening. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I I, <coughs> um, I can't go to the proof, but uh, if, if you trust me, uh, trust me that it uh, it, it works. <laughs> <laughs> State state modeling, yeah. Um, so state space modeling is also a great way of modeling time series, and you can incorporate a lot of information there. And there are another great option. So there's actually a new library called uh, PyMC Time Series. Uh, so so there's two parts to that answer. One is I'm not necessarily advocating for like, for example, modeling time series with Gaussian processes like I did here. Um, you can use state space models, you can use Gaussian random walks. So here I'm really just like presenting to you a Lego box and saying, okay, well build cool models that fit your purpose. So if the best fit for you is a state space model or for this, then like for all means we should use it. So we should use both, <coughs> run the model and compare and see which one works better. Um, the technical reason is that for a long time it was difficult to like make those models fast in PyMC, but just in the last couple of weeks, really, we made a lot of progress where now we can run these more complex state space models and make them scale. Yeah, but there's a limitation in that model, which is pretty fast. And some might say that state space modeling is like a better way to Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, yeah, I, I love state space models. So, um, yeah, they, they now work in PyMC. Thank you for the question. Oh. The last one. Okay. okay. Uh, how about the footprint of the PMC? I mean, if I want to run on embedded system. Embedded systems, uh, for example. Uh, micro Python on the. What? what? Micro Python for embedded system. Ah, okay. So, can you run on embedded system? I love that. I never got that question before. Um, and I always was like, well, yeah, I like it. <clears throat> Wouldn't that be cool? So um, I don't think anyone has done that. However, there are there's a lot of flexibility in how you run these models. And I alluded to this a little bit, where the way it works technically is you write your model in PyMC, and then what we do with that code is it builds up a computational graph. And then that computational graph, we can compute gradients for, which is important for more advanced sampling algorithms like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And but we can also take that graph in and compile it to different backends. So we can compile it to C, uh, which is the default, or we can compile it to generate JAX code that, that computes that graph, or to number code, or even to um, pilot it so that you can run it in the browser. And so I don't know much about embedded computing, but you can also compile it to whatever target. Um, have there and then run it there. So that that would be a path. Yeah, cool. Thank you.